welcome to the Empire Was Right, the series, where I use clear and obvious evidence from the live-action and theatrically released Star Wars films to explain the obvious fact that the Empire was right. In this video, I will be covering these topics. To the uneducated masses, Palpatine, whether he is Chancellor or Emperor, is seen as some sort of major villain. And oftentimes, the basis for such claims stems from him playing both sides during the Separatist revolt of the Clone Wars. But on so many levels, this war was one of the most justified and safest wars in all of film, television, and real life. For starters, we have to look at the Republic at the time. It is in disarray, with the Senate being inherently useless. The bureaucrats are in charge now. To further prove this point, members of the Republic were literally attacking each other as the Trade Federation blockaded and invaded Naboo. As you know, our blockade is perfectly legal. How corrupt and useless is the government that it can't even stop member states under its own control from warring against each other? I must be frank, Your Majesty, there is little chance the Senate will act on the invasion. The Republic needed to evolve. You could call for a vote of no confidence in Chancellor Valorum. The current system in place didn't work. It is clear to me now that the Republic no longer functions. Palpatine being elected Chancellor was a step in the right direction. Congratulations on your election, Chancellor. But not enough. I have good news for you, my lord. The war has begun. Excellent. But like I said earlier, this was one of the safest wars of all time. Even before the Clone Wars, the invasion of Naboo was relatively victimless. Obi-Wan debunked the claim that there were mass casualties. The death toll is catastrophic. We must bow to their wishes. You must contact me. It's a trick. 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 Send no reply. Send no transmissions of any kind. The only real victims were the Naboo Royal Guard during the insurrection that they themselves instigated. And let's keep in mind, Palpatine was a native of Naboo. Even though it was a harmless invasion, he was fine with sacrificing his planet to do it. Essentially, he did something very similar to the Good Alabama Brother. Which, for those of you that are unfamiliar, the Good Alabama Brother is when a guy from Alabama sees that someone will be a good boyfriend and husband for his sister. So he stops dating her. And much like a Good Alabama Brother, Palpatine risked what was his to help others. But regarding the Clone Wars specifically, the violence and suffering that usually precedes most wars was noticeably absent. The war was so victimless that the only real-world comparison would be the Toledo War from 1835 to 1836. This bloodless war involved some slack-jawed mouth-breathers from God's Mistake, Michigan, wanting to invade Ohio to annex Toledo. But the war never escalated to violence, because even the inbred hicks from Michigan knew that Toledo wasn't worth the effort even though Toledo would fit in nicely with all the spousal abuse and crystal meth production that Michigan is famous for. But back to the point. The Clone Wars were inherently victimless. The main combatants of the Separatists were soulless droids, and on the opposite side were clones, which were also soulless and unable to inherit the Kingdom of Heaven. Hashtag Matthew 1619. How can Palpatine be a bad guy? He had artificially engineered mechanical warriors fight artificially engineered organic warriors. A true victimless war. It is worth mentioning on Geonosis, the wayward Anakin during his regrettable Jedi phase, Obi-Wan and Padme were being put to death for the illegal action of espionage. And it was during this encounter where the Jedi first initiated hostilities. Master Windu, how pleasant of you to join us. This party's over. And then initiated more hostilities. and killed this kid's dad. And it was the bloodlust of Yoda that brought the clones into this encounter which eventually led to thousands of the native Geonosians dying. While normally I would say this was a bad thing, which it was, I am okay with it. Because f bugs. What the hell was that? I said f What the f Why can't I f***ing say f on my own damn video? Oh well, f fucking move on. As the war progresses, we see more and more clones versus droids. Battle after battle of unnatural beings fighting each other. We see a war span multiple planets where no one loses a father, a brother, a son, nothing. 
Dare I say, the only real victims of this encounter were Dooku, who took the fighting so close to Coruscant that he probably led to casualties from debris and shrapnel, so he deserved what he got. Good, Anakin. And the other casualties were the Jedi through Order 66, as was discussed in Episode 1 of this series. And as was discussed there, they deserved it. So yes, Palpatine played both sides, but also hurt no innocent person or animal. How more righteous can a commander be that they fight a victimless war? The next topic I would like to discuss is the misconception of slavery under the Empire. There is a lot of controversy surrounding slavery in the Empire, even though slavery is shockingly absent under both the Empire and the First Order. Of the 11 Star Wars films, slavery is only mentioned in two of them. The first film that is mentioned is in The Phantom Menace. You're a slave? I'm a person and my name is Anakin. And the real takeaway from the discussion is the Republic is so flawed that it can't even outlaw slavery. I can't believe there's still slavery in the galaxy. The Republic's anti-slavery laws are- The Republic doesn't exist out here. Which in itself gives great justification to Palpatine evolving the flawed Republic into his bountiful and nurturing empire. Which Anakin evidences very clearly. I have brought peace, freedom, 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 justice, and security to my new empire. But we also see that the Jedi have an ambivalence to slavery. Obi-Wan said it best. For over a thousand generations, the Jedi Knights were the guardians of peace and justice in the galaxy. The operative word is galaxy. The Jedi were to offer peace and justice to the galaxy. What type of justice is allowing slavery in the galaxy, even if it is outside of the Republic? Now in fairness, Qui-Gon Jinn did initially want Anakin and his mom to be freed from Watto. I'll wager my new racing bot against, say, the boy and his mother. But he doesn't seem too invested in the negotiations. No pod is worth two slaves, not by a long shot. The boy then. If anything, he is the Star Wars version of an immigration officer. He is a government employee who wants to take a child away from his mother. Muchos gracias, Qui-Gon. You split up a family. Fun fact about Qui-Gon Jinn. In Spanish, his name is Qui-Gon Hin. In German, it is Qui-Gon Yin. And in Chinese, his name is Keith. Fast forward a bit, the Jedi do some slick brainwashing of Anakin where they deprive him of all of his attachments. Attachments for men. And the Jedi literally forbid him from seeing his enslaved mother as he is reminded to abide by his quote-unquote commitments. Be mindful of your thoughts, Anakin. They betray you. You've made a commitment to the Jedi Order, a commitment not easily broken. And he can't even go see his mother until his visions of her suffering are so unbearable that he literally has to defy his orders to see her. I know I'm disobeying my mandate to protect you, Senator. But I have to go. I have to help her. Those are some real heroes right there, just letting humans be subjugated. Beyond that, there is really only one other mention of slavery. <laughs> What was he saying? He said the Wookiees were enslaved by the Empire, taken off Kashyyyk. But much like Barry Bonds being the greatest home run hitter of all time, there need to be some asterisks next to that statement. The first being, the Wookiees sided with the Jedi and helped the war criminal Yoda escape from Kashyyyk, where he then went on to deprive Vader of lawful access to his children. Split up, they should be. And Yoda went on to train the war criminal Luke Skywalker, even to an organization as affectionate and nurturing as the burgeoning Empire, such a treasonous act as assisting Yoda escape should not go unpunished. With that in mind, historically, the punishment for treason has always been death. But in many cultures, death, even when not involving treason, was seen as a rather inefficient way to deal with healthy, living people and creatures. The 2004 film Troy displays this greatly. Instead of having armies fight to the death, with even the winning side sustaining casualties, Respective leaders would often elect one or more soldiers to fight. I don't want to watch another massacre. <laughs> Let's settle this war in the old manner. Your best fighter against my best. And whichever side won would be the victor, and the other side would be subjugated to slavery or joining the opposing military. They won't fight for you. That's what the Mycenaeans said. And the Arcadians. And the Apeans. Now, they all fight for me. So for the Wookiees and their betrayal, slavery was a better overall option than death. But wait, there is another asterisk that needs to quantify the claim made by Chewbacca. The amount of Wookiees enslaved by the Empire was never made clear. 
As can be seen in the film Solo, it only appears that the Wookiees of Chewbacca's family or tribe were enslaved. As a key figure in helping the delinquent wrongdoer Yoda escape, it makes logical sense that the Angelic Empire would only punish Chewbacca and his closest associates that helped him smuggle Yoda off of Kashyyyk. But wait, there is one more important asterisk. What evidence is there that Chewie was even being honest? If the Wookiees were supposedly taken from Kashyyyk as slaves and sent to Kessel, what was Chewie doing on Mimba? It would make no sense that the Empire would keep a wild beast, they literally call him that. Go. Feed him to the beast. The beast? Wait, there's a beast? Hold on. Move it. And also, why would they have him chained up in Mimba instead of working in the Kessel Mines after being taken from Kashyyyk? It makes no sense. Furthermore, the odds are incredibly small that the Wookiees on Kessel are his tribe. In such a large galaxy, it makes for slim odds that he goes to Mimba and they go to Kessel and then they randomly meet up again. I think he faked the whole reunion. Also, based off the logic that it takes one to know one, if his future best friend Han Solo is a liar, cheat, and smuggler, Chewie would be also. Boys, you're both gonna get what I promised. Have I ever not delivered for you before? Yeah. What was the second time? Your game is old. But to really round things out, even if the Empire did enslave the Wookiees, what is so wrong about that? Wookiees are more or less animals when compared to the other civilized species. The Wookiees have by far the most primitive of weapons and most primitive structures of all the homeworlds in the Star Wars films. They have not even evolved the notion of clothing. Granted, the need for pants is not necessarily warranted as they clearly have small genitalia that is already naturally covered. Additionally, their communication abilities are less on par with advanced dialogue and more in line with the sound of a middle-aged man relieving himself through the aid of lingerie ads in the newspaper. And lastly, members of the Republican resistance talk down to Chewbacca like he is a dumb animal instead of treat him like an evolutionary equal. Get in there, you big dummy! I don't care what you smell! You sleeping I thought that hairy beast would be the end of me. I need help with this giant hairy thing! Chewie, what are you doing here? Heck, he doesn't even get a medal for blowing up millions of innocent Imperial officers, peacekeepers, and support staff. Goddamned Al-Qaeda gets 40 virgins, and this guy can't even get a fancy collar. 